pretty excited to uh, be here this morning, um, and especially excited to introduce such a uh, such an impressive panel. Um, the topic that we're that we're queuing up, I think, is something that has um, the need for really good conversation and good dialogue of sort of Wyoming. Um, as everybody knows, um, the Integrated Test Center's first tenant is going to be the, the Carbon Enterprise. And also the state and and Sheriff Authority is working very hard to find opportunities for the larger test bay. And in the context of all of all that, um, the conversation about what, what can we do in Wyoming to make sure that um, if there are business opportunities to create um, additional um, technologies, um, whether it's in carbon capture or it's in carbon utilization. Um, those are all very important things for Wyoming. Um, with all that's going on in our economy, the, the ability to continue to diversify our economy is extremely important. And while everybody would agree, I think, that the drivers um, behind um, the issues related to CO2 and CO2 regulation are ever changing, I don't find anybody in the industry that disagrees that um, carbon and CO2 and how we deal with that is something that we all are going to have to figure out in the future. So um, this, this panel is going to talk a lot about um, the, the financial side. And while we can't draw exact parallels to what's currently happening in the financing um, development and what, what may be called the CO2 asset industry because it really doesn't exist yet, the ability to draw parallels from other experience is really important when we figure out the next steps um, on what we need to do. So that being said, I'd like to um, introduce this impressive panel to the group. Um, starting off, I'd like to introduce Matt Kaufman. Um, Matt is a partner with Hathaway and Coons uh, based in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Matt's legal practices focuses on business, corporate, transactional, litigation matters, ranging from entity formations, financing, and operational issues to intellectual property protection, mergers and acquisitions, regulatory compliance, technology. Uh, Matt is one of the only the few attorneys in Wyoming representing clients in private placement and securities matters. Matt's deeply involved in local and regional entrepreneurship. He co-founded the Wyoming Entrepreneurs Group that meets in Cheyenne, has a published academic article on developing entrepreneurship in Wyoming, a recent article on the newly passed crowdfunding legislation is counseled to dozens of startups, emerging technology companies, and investing funds across Wyoming. He's an active tech and real estate investor. Additionally, Matt's latest adventure includes being co-founder and acting chairman of the Race School of Technology and Design, which is Wyoming's first private equity school. If you haven't been there, I recommend you go for a tour. It's pretty awesome. Um, in addition to graduating from the University of Wyoming with a BA and a JD, Matt has a, has a graduate law degree from the University of Colorado. He also serves on the Board of Advisors for the University of Wyoming Law School, is a graduate of Leadership Wyoming, and was recently appointed by Governor Mead to serve on the Executive Council of the newly established Endow uh, Initiative. And what are you doing on the weekends? <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, um, very impressive. Um, also, uh, sitting next to Matt, uh, Liza Mellett. Um, Liza, is a, she's an experienced financial business development professional. She's passionate about entrepreneurship and creating opportunities in Jackson. She works as an investment advisor at Income Focus, Income Focus Portfolio Management, a Jackson-based registered investment advisor. She also runs the Central Wyoming College Silicon Coolur Startup. Intensive, which is a 10 week entrepreneurial boot camp. She's a co founder and board member of Silicon Couleur, a Jackson based nonprofit whose mission is to nurture entrepreneurship in the greater Teton region. She also founded and runs the Silicon Couleur Angel Mentor Network, the only angel investment group in the state of Wyoming. Liza has worked with a number of startup businesses, both on strategy, fundraising, and business development. Before moving to Jackson, Liza spent 12 years on Wall Street in the investment side of business. She started her career at Cowan & Company, worked at Goldman Sachs, helped grow one startup MBA company, and three startup hedge fund businesses in New York. Liza has an MBA from the Wharton School of Business, 
and graduated from Dartmouth College. She was most recently recognized um, as a Wyoming Woman in Leadership Award as a mentor of the year. So she also uh, was extremely busy. Um, and I learned last night um, she uh, worked all of this in a um, very busy schedule. And we're just uh, excited to have her along with uh, um, the next uh, panelist I'd like to introduce, Tom Chapman. Well, Tom is the principal with Human Up Partners, a global investor based in Jackson, Wyoming, investing in hedge funds, real estate, and private equity funds. Previously, he was the vice president of Gardner Capital Management Corporation, a New York-based family office where he managed the firm's real estate and hedge fund investment strategies. Tom is a founding member of Colony Capital's Asian real estate business based in Singapore. Previously, he worked with Tiger Management as a research analyst and at Goldman Sachs. He started his career at Tudor Investment Corporation, where he worked as a proprietary global macro trader in London. Tom is a trustee of the Wyoming Retirement System and is the chair of its investment committee and serves on the governance committee. He currently serves on the finance committee and is chair of the investment committee for Francis Parker School in San Diego, California. He serves on the board of the Institute for Arts and Humanities at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Tom served on the JDRF International Board from 2010 to 2016. He was previously chair of the investment and nominating and governance committee. Tom currently serves on the research and investment committee and serves as a board observer with Bicycle Inc. Tom received his BA from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and his MBA from Columbia Business School. So as I, as I went through the, uh, the introductions and the bios, um, I convinced myself that I am a horrible underachiever. <laughs> um, but but I, will, I will point out this, that um, this is an exceptional panel, very, um, very well put together from the perspective of the content, and I think they'll be able to give us some valuable insights that we look on. Uh, on the issue of how to, what we need to do to create these financial ecosystem support and development our technologies. So with that, I'll turn it over to our first um, speaker, and that will be, see, Eliza, yes. Eliza, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Definitely need to watch. Well, I'm um, just to be here, and I wanted to sort of touch on three things. Are, one, I wanted to talk about Silicon Couloir and the entrepreneurial ecosystem that we've built here. It's not, I don't think it's Better? Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk about three things, and that was, first I wanted to start with Silicon Couloir. I was one of the founding board members about six years ago, and what we have done to build an entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Jackson. Then I wanted to touch on what I know about the early stage investing landscape here in Wyoming. And then I wanted to touch very briefly on some thoughts on specifically investing in carbon capture, which I know very little about, but I think you'll find those comments slightly relevant. Um, so about six years ago, you know, I moved to Jackson 10 years ago almost from um, New York City. And I spent my college summers working on new branches out here, so I always wanted to come back. And that's um, my one only sort of story as my father brought me out here to work on, to come out to a new branch in our family when I was 15, and I was pretty much hooked. So, um, but when I got out here, I was sort of, I spent a couple of years living under the radar, and then I decided I was tired of talking about skiing all the time. I love to ski, but, and I love to bike, but I didn't want to talk about it all the time. So I got a group of people together to start an angel investment group um, so we could talk about you know, the, the interesting situations where we're seeing here and in other places. And we started that in about right, right in the depths of, so of the recession. So it was a lot of talk for a long time. And I think the first three years, no one got an investment. But it was still fun, and that sort of morphed into co-founding Silicon Coolbar. So Silicon Coolbar is a 501c3 whose mission is to, originally was to nurture entrepreneurship in the Tetons, and now it is more specifically to align entrepreneurship with community vision. And that's because, especially here in Jackson, our culture, and, and really in, in most towns, but our culture here is so important to all of us, and that's why we moved here, and we want to make sure that that culture 
is preserved for future generations is talked about in our local comp plan and then how can we find really can we how can we grow and nurture community minded entrepreneurs um, not just any entrepreneur but community minded entrepreneurs whose values reflect the values that our community holds um, so what started as an email that went out to a big group of people saying anyone that wants to talk about entrepreneurship let's meet at Shooting Star on the first Monday of the month. And it happened to be during spring break. And we thought, hey, if anyone shows up, that's cool. And if no one does, we'll have, the four of us will have fun having some beers. We broke a fire code that day. And over 100 people showed up to talk about entrepreneurship. And they were anyone from people who wanted to invest in and, and mentor in entrepreneurship to people who thought they wanted to work in an entrepreneurial company to founders, to service providers. And that kicked off what is now um, six years in. We still meet the first Monday of every month. Um, we get probably 50 to 80 people in every event. We have a speaker, or we started out with just something we called two minute drills, which were we would find new entrepreneurs and let them speak for two minutes about what they were doing, and we just find five of them. So our content was like 10 minutes, but it was sort of introducing people in the system and what they were working on. And the idea, we call it chance meetings because we had studied a lot of successful entrepreneurial ecosystems. And one of the things that was really important is when you're in Silicon Valley and you're, you know, in Menlo Park and you're walking down the street, you see your friend, and, oh, Tom, I'm amazed to talk to you. You got to, what are you working on? Oh, you should talk to Matt because he could help you with this. And that was really important. So the idea that people get to show up every month and know they're going to see people again and know they're going to be able to connect again is really important to that entrepreneurial ecosystem. And then, of course, you know, one of the things that was really lacking when we started to talk through our entrepreneurial ecosystem was the funding side of things. And so the angel group folded into Silicon Cool Bar. Um, and that angel group, uh, it's an informal angel group, but I have about 50 members and we meet, you know, about once a month. And our focus is on local deals, but we go out to the greater um, Rocky Mountain ecosystem, and even further if we feel a deal, if I feel a deal really relates to our group. And that then merged into starting a, something we call Pitch Day. So if you've ever watched Shark Tank on CNBC, then you know sort of the idea of that. And we have an open call for companies every um, every April, and then they come in and give an eight minute pitch. They get six get chosen, and then they get coached all summer long, and then they present on stage in front of, we had three, 250, 300 people this summer at the Center for the Arts. And these companies are all local companies, and they are raising, they were raising anywhere from 300,000 to $3 million. So, and just, to, you know, our numbers are not that big. This, our, I did a calculation last night for you all, and our angel group had 15 companies present last year, or in the last 12 months, and um, six of them have gotten funding, and that, but that range is about sort of 1.2 million dollars. But for startup funding, that's you know that's not so bad, and that's all poured back into our ecosystem here. And just to sort of clarify what an ecosystem is to us and to me is, for one, it's not just Jackson. You know, we think of the Silicon Core ecosystem as being um, within the sort of 100 mile radius of Jackson. So we are very actively involved with Silicon, um, with Teton Valley, Idaho, and then down to Alpine. That's sort of what we think of as our range. Um, and then we also think of an entrepreneurial ecosystem of needing, first of all, you need the companies, the entrepreneurs that want to start companies. Then you need the people that want to work for startups and have the skills necessary. You need the service providers like the lawyers and the accountants and the social media experts. You need the mentors, which is incredibly, incredibly important to these small entrepreneurs. You need the funding. And that's sort of the circle that we think about. Um, so I'm more than happy to, you know, answer any questions about Silicon Core later. But 
I think that fits really nicely into, you know, Governor Means in Dow, which is, you know, we, we have we need a third leg to this, you know, state economy. And I know that often in China they talk about technology and I think in Silicon Valley we talk more about growth capital companies because Technology may, I mean, all companies really use technology these days, so what does that even really mean? If you're a retail company and you're selling online, you're using technology. But, you know, in particular here, the companies that come through have no real, so this year at Pitch Day, we had a, um, with a vitamin supplements company, we had six deals with the NFL, we had a company that was um, doing an online travel thing, we had a company that was doing, um, building bathing suits for uh, larger size women. I mean, it's really all across the board. There's no real theme. We do tend to see a fair amount of things that relate to the outdoors because we have such a strong, um, you know, backing for that here. But it's companies all across the board, and not just technology. Um, so then I'll talk a little bit more about what I've seen in the funding here. Um, it's very limited. So, you know, I think that we're the only angel investment group in the state of Wyoming, and we don't have a dedicated fund, so as some angel groups do. Um, we do try to talk to angel groups in other parts of the Rocky Mountain West. So I will send deals to the Boise Angels or Park City Angels if they're not successful or if I think they might be a match for them. There's one small fund that people have probably heard about called Breakthrough 307, and actually Jared Stack was supposed to be on the panel today, but I, he asked me to take his place. Um, they're a very small fund, but they're talking already about launching a second fund, so they are seeing some you know, good demand. There is a local fund that is has yet to be announced yet that is getting their ducks in a row to start here in Jackson that will be, or in Teton Valley, Idaho, that will be having Rocky Mountain focus. Um, there is a small fund called Petro's Capital that I don't know a lot about, but they have a $5 million fund. And then we have Enhanced Capital, which does some SBIC funding. And they've been relatively active. But I mean, these are tiny funds, five million, two million, I mean, really tiny. So I think when we think about, you know, this industry and really any startup industry, it is necessary to think more regionally, I think. Um, I have people that call me off and are like dying for a Wyoming deal, you know, and so because they are doing Rocky Mountain West and that's their mandate and a lot of them don't have a Wyoming deal yet, um, but I'm sure it's to come. But thinking, thinking more regionally about the Rocky Mountain West and how we tighten our ties with, you know, a lot of the investing activity that's going on in Utah or, you know, the growing system, the growing entrepreneurial ecosystem in Montana and Idaho, I think that's something that we really need to strengthen ties there as a state. Um, so, and then, you know, another thing that I, I have noticed, and this is, um, this is difficult in Wyoming, and I'm not sure how to do it, but since there are a lot of smart people in the room, I'll uh, throw it out there. And that, you know, there are some states that are doing tax incentives for, um, you know, for investing in startups. I have a very good friend in London, and what they have there, companies can apply to be part of this, um, forget the name of it, but this system. And once they've applied, any money they raise up to a million dollars has significant tax benefits for those that invest in in those companies. Since we don't have a state tax, you know, I don't know quite how you figure that out. But Delaware has something, you know, Minnesota has something, and you can structure these to be very specific to different industries that you want to grow or different uh, asset classes you want to grow. So that's something, you know, that hopefully Dow's kicking around to think about. Um, and then very lastly, I wanted to talk about, you know, um, carbon capture in particular. And I think there's a lot of 
Having spent a lot of my life on the investing side of the business, and particularly in more risky asset classes, because I was in small and micro cap stocks for a lot of my career, I think the question that we need to think about is not as much about how to grow the capital um, base here in Wyoming, but I think we need to talk more about how do you de-risk the investment? Because the capital is there, the capital's there, you know, I found in my angel group, people don't care where the gifts come from. They just want, you know, a, a good risk return situation. So how do we de-risk carbon capture so that the money will come? Instead of how do you increase the amount of capital here in Wyoming, you know? There's a lot of hedge funds out there, there's a lot of companies out there, there's a lot of corporate investment out there. So how do we de-risk the industry? And, you know, I'll throw out, I think this would be a great topic for discussion as a group, but I'll throw out, you know, just a couple of very high level, you know, thoughts on that. So let's just paint some scenarios. Let's say Elon Musk, because you can de-risk the situation in a, um, perceptually or actually, you know, and perceptually, you have someone like Elon Musk invest in carbon capture. The world will look at it differently, right? They'll look at it like, a really smart people is invested in this, so maybe I should start looking there. Um, another idea is just to sort of, you know, get a very large coal company or somebody related to say, I'm putting, you know, 5% of our future assets in this because that degrades it because they're saying, they're a thought leader who's saying, I'm putting my money for this future investment. And then maybe even just sort of some more education. So you're, instead of leading scientists and researchers talking about the science behind it, maybe they're also starting to talk in combination with a financial person about the financial case behind it. So those are some specific ideas. Thank you. So uh, as was said a few minutes ago, my name is Matt Kaufman. Uh, so just a little bit to give some context about what I do and, and I think why I'm here. Uh, my private practice in Cheyenne uh, for the last six or seven years has largely focused on, on representing startup companies, what I would reference as emerging growth companies, and a lot of those in Wyoming um, are raising capital. So when a company needs to find uh, private investors or raise capital, uh, we call that a private placement. The reason it's called private placement is it's not a public offering, which you all know what those are. And those are highly, highly regulated by the Securities Exchange Commission. So when a company goes out for private money, uh, one of my jobs as a legal advisor to these companies is to make sure that they go gather investors and find investors and take that money in a way that's legal and not violating securities laws. So I warned these guys beforehand, I'm gonna, I'm gonna geek out for just a minute and I'm gonna tell you all just a little bit about the securities law background because I think it's important for the context and so it, and for the discussion that we can have about different avenues for raising capital in Wyoming. So, so generally speaking, there, there's two layers of regulation over anybody that wants to raise money. The first is, of course, the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and then secondly is state regulation. Fortunately, in Wyoming, we don't have a lot of particular state regulation. I'll talk about uh, some of it in, in a few minutes. So when a, when, a, when a startup company, when a private company wants to go out and raise money, they have to find, assuming they're not going to register as a, register as a public offering and go through all the hoops that uh, are, are associated with a public offering, they have to find an exemption under securities law. And I'm sure we've got a, a lot of smart, sophisticated people in this room. Everyone's heard of regulation D offerings or rate D offerings. That's what people are referencing when they say that. It's a safe harbor exemption from securities law. So the, the three most important or, or most well known rate D exemptions for the past 20 years have been three rules. They're referenced as Rule 504, 505, and 506. 505, as of this last uh, congressional session and rule change with it, the SEC no longer exists, so it's gone. There's no more 505. So we're left with 504 and 506. So 504 is a small, small company exemption. That basically says if you're raising up to a million bucks, um, you can, you have to file a registration with the SEC, but you can go raise up to a million bucks. The disclosure requirements are really limited. You don't have to disclose to investors a whole lot. The operating documents can be pretty minimal. 
so companies don't have to spend a ton of time and resources developing what those upgrade documents look like. Rule 506, and, and by, by the way, almost no one uses 504 ever. I've never done a 504 filing, so. 506 is the, is the one that everyone uses. And then within 506, we have now two, actually three, uh, different versions of offering. The first one is called the 506B offering. So if you've ever invested in a private company, uh, it's probably been under a 506B offering. 506B offerings have no limits, so you can raise any amount of money, uh, but you're limited to what are called 35 uh, non-accredited purchasers. Again, I'm sure you've all heard the term accredited investor or accredited purchaser. Accredited is just simply, uh, there's a definition that the SEC has put out, and it's, it's, it's I guess, the government's way of defining those who can fend for themselves financially versus those who can't. So if you're deemed to be an accredited investor under the Securities Exchange uh, Act and laws, you, you don't have to be given as much disclosure or as much information when you're making an investment. If you're a non-accredited investor, the risk for the company issuing the securities is a little higher because your, your obligation to them is higher. So generally speaking, I won't go through all of it, but an accredited investor is someone with a liquid net worth of more than a million dollars or that makes more than $200,000 a year. And hearing rumblings that that may change, uh, it's a definition that hasn't been changed in a long time. But anyways, so under the 506B offerings, uh, you can have up to 35 non-accredited investors, which is actually quite a few. And then you can have an unlimited number of investors that are accredited. Under a 506C offering, and let me, let me back up, historically, the policy of the, the SEC and the rules has always been that when you as a private company go out to gain investors and to find investors, you can only get investment from people that you have a substantive, pre-existing relationship with. And I'll tell you, a lot of lawyers have gotten very rich litigating what that term means. But what it basically means is you can't go out and just offer it to anybody and everybody. It has to be someone that you know. That's, uh, out of that is why we hear about so many companies uh, very early stage doing friends and family rounds. Uh, it's people that you know, it's people that you trust, probably people who won't serve you. And uh, that's, that's a common place to start. Under the 506 rank the offerings though, you can, you can generally, again, go talk to people. You can even hire a broker dealer to help you find people that they might know and have a pre-existing relationship with. So there's ways to cast the net wide, but there's still some limiting factors on it. Under the now new 506C, which was a, a Jobs Act change under the Obama administration, um, that, that, that prohibition on general solicitation, on using mass media and telling the world that, hey, I'm a company, I'm looking for investors, has now been lifted. So there's very stringent requirements under 506C that you have to follow, the ways that you have to verify that people are looking for investors. But this new 506C offering is uh, at least from my opinion, and in Wyoming, is a very exciting uh, change because of the great geographic disparity we have in Wyoming for companies wanting to raise money. The idea of being able to use social media or, or other types of online offering platforms is pretty exciting. So that's that's 506 c um, There's a, the last exemption that I'll talk about under federal securities laws, and it's called 3A11. It, so it's an intra-state offering exemption. So the SEC and the federal government has taken the position that if you as a company are only raising money within the four corners, in our case, in Wyoming, the four corners of the state, and you can certify and verify that no investors are being offered to purchase from outside the state, then you don't have to, quote unquote, comply with the federal regulations. You can only be uh, concerned with your state regulations. So that's called an intrastate offering. So then moving from the SEC to Wyoming, uh, Wyoming really doesn't have any rules on, on private placements. Um, basically, Wyoming has adopted all of the, uh, the SEC rules and regulations. So if you're doing an offering in, uh, in Wyoming, you basically just have to pick one of the federal exemptions to comply with. Until this last July, 2017, we have a brand new offering mechanism here in Wyoming. I'm sure you seen some publicity from it from, uh, from my good friend Ed Murray in the Secretary of State's office, and it's something called WIND, Wyoming Invest Now, which is now an intrastate crowdfunding offering here in Wyoming. 
So crowdfunding, I didn't really talk about that as one of the avenues under the Federal Securities Act because for the, uh, for the, for the what we call Jobs Act crowdfunding, you still have to find a federal exemption with which to do that offering. And crowdfunding was kind of meaningless there for a few years when it was first passed because of that general solicitation ban that I talked about. Once the general solicitation ban was lifted, then crowdfunding became a lot more meaningful and we started seeing more online platforms. The, uh, the problem and the problem, I guess the, the prohibitive aspect of what I call, again, jobs, uh, job tax crowdfunding, which is federal crowdfunding exemptions, is that under the federal legislation, you have to do one of those offerings through a registered uh, broker dealer, a crowdfunding broker dealer. So that's why we've seen a lot of these websites pop up that conduct crowdfunding offerings. Um, there's only a certain number of them that are even registered and permitted to do jobs at crowdfunding operations, and you have to use one of them with your company. So for a lot of my clients that come here and they have these great visions of doing crowdfunding offerings, it becomes a really, really interesting discussion because if you're only going to raise a million bucks or a half a million bucks or two million bucks and you want to do it via crowdfunding, you might wind up paying three or four hundred thousand dollars of that just in, in fees. Uh, to the crowdfunding platform and for you know compliance purposes, so it becomes a little bit prohibitive um, from that from that standpoint. So back to the Wyoming crowdfunding in, in July of this this past year, the uh, revisions to the Wyoming Securities Act became effective, and so now we have uh, we now have a crowdfunding option here in Wyoming. So it falls into that very last federal exemption that I talked about, which is the intrastate exemption. So again. Um, well, I'll tell you, no one has yet done a crowdfunding offering in Wyoming. I'm, I'm working on what I think is, will be the first one uh, in, in Wyoming, but no one's done it yet. So if it goes well, I'll, tell, I'll have to come back and tell you how it went. But, but basically, you have to, or you're permitted to use, again, general solicitations. You can use an online platform, social media, whatever you want to raise money. But you have to come up with some way to certify or verify that only people within Wyoming are being offered. Again, from the Securities and Exchange Commission standpoint, who is being offered the deal is just as important as who purchases ultimately and actually invests. And so, um, so that's, but it's nonetheless exciting because even if you don't use online online means, there's still ways to mass disseminate uh, an offering like a crowdfunding offering uh, to get it out there to as many people as possible. So, uh, limitations under the crowdfunding act in Wyoming. Unfortunately, for a lot of big companies, they're already steering away from it because uh, there's there's two tiers of the crowdfunding uh, exemption here in Wyoming. The first tier only allows for up to a million dollars. And so if you qualify under federal rates as a, an accredited investor, you can invest any amount of, of that million dollars. If you're not accredited, though, there's some pretty strict requirements that I can't remember off the top of my head what they are. It's, it's a weird formula. You have to basically calculate people's net worth and figure out how much they can invest. Uh, there's a second tier to the crowdfunding uh, act here in Wyoming that allows up to $2 million to be invested. But again, for, for larger companies or for companies that want to do big offerings, $2 million bucks may not have cut it. And so that's that's something that we have to uh, have to evaluate. It's just kind of a practical matter, and I'll just kind of tell you all what I've talked through with my clients. Uh, again, if you're interested in using the crowdfunding mechanism, it's kind of weird to me sometimes the reasons that companies want to use crowdfunding. Again, there, there have been contexts and, and good reasons to use it. A lot of people just want to piggyback off of the, I guess, the, the PR that they might get from doing a, a crowdfunding offering and just kind of the, the, the mass amounts of people that are learning about the offering and they think that's going to benefit their company. In reality, though, nobody really wants to, if you're an entrepreneur or a you know, startup, nobody wants to manage 100 investors over you know, 200,000 bucks or 300,000 bucks. That's a nightmare. That's ridiculous. You'd better go talk to guys like Tom and you know, get that one or two deals and have a much smaller group that you have to manage. So that's, that's a phenomenon that I think is really interesting because crowdfunding is often talked about. It's often celebrated as a as a mechanism or a viable mechanism to get capital. Uh, again, I, I don't want to be down on it because I think there are uh, there certain situations where crowdfunding is really valuable, but for a lot of startups, crowdfunding isn't that great of an option for them right from the outset. 
So that's kind of the lay of the land, the different types of, of offerings that are available. Now what I want to talk about is some of the deals that I've seen in Wyoming, uh, some of the ways that I've seen companies and helped companies raise money that have been the most successful. And I want to talk just a little bit about uh, investment vernacular. I just, I, I did talk uh, last week actually to the County Commissioner Association. I don't see any familiar faces from that talk in this room, but one of the things that I was talking about uh, there is, and both people here sitting to my right would know a lot more about this than even I would, but we have a little bit of a problem, in my opinion, in Wyoming, in terms of the playing field and what people generally know about startup investing, about finance, uh, and, and just investment capital structuring. And sometimes it's a little bit frustrating to me. I, I'm, not, I'm not, you know, down on it necessarily. I think one of the people are smart and they get it. We just haven't had a lot of big exposure to it. But one of the things that frustrates me is when I when I do deals in Boulder or Silicon Valley or you know Dallas, Texas or wherever, everybody on the street knows what a Series A round is, and a Series C round. And they know what an angel investor is. They know what a VC is. And why do we seem to confuse terms all the time and kind of use them interchangeably? And I think that sometimes creates a barrier for getting deals done. And so. One of the things I, I often talk through with my clients is understanding what the different types of capital even are. And again, I feel really underqualified to be talking about this with these two people sitting here, so I'll let them clean up what I might mess up. But just, again, to kind of put everybody on the same playing field, I mean, there's, there's, there's seed capital, right? There's really early stage capital that could come from any source. Um, there's angel capital. So angel investors are, typically speaking, people that just want to invest in companies. Maybe they're high net worth individuals, maybe they're not that high net worth individuals, but they're people that want to invest in companies uh, and support companies. Uh, groups like, like Liza was talking about with uh, that are organized angel groups are so valuable because it gives an opportunity for companies to go to one place and get exposure to a whole bunch of, of, of angel investors, which is, which is really cool. Then we have venture capitalists, and uh, I'm not, Again, as was mentioned a few minutes ago, I'm not even really aware of very many actual venture capital firms that operate in Wyoming. A venture capital is typically structured with some type of a major exit in mind, very short term, uh, extremely high growth, usually larger amounts of investment that being tranched. Um, so I, I get a little frustrated sometimes when I hear the term venture capital thrown around in Wyoming because there's not very many venture capital deals happening uh, in the true sense. And then we have private equity deals, which is more like you know really large institutional type money. Uh, and and so, anyways, all those different types of capital have different places and they have different uses. Uh, what I think maybe we're talking about today more than anything is some of the earlier stage capital opportunities. And so, within Wyoming, the ones that I've seen that have been the most successful. And I got, I got permission from my client to talk about it today. If any of you have heard about the McGinley Orthopedics out of Casper, and Dr. McGinley um, has had a tremendous amount of success uh, raising money here in Wyoming. And um, so, so I have represented him through all four of his investment rounds. Uh, we've raised today just a little over $12 million um, with, and, and I guess in my opinion, with an amazingly unstructured offering platform. It has truly been through a series of rounds that have been offerings to people that Joe Manley knew or was introduced to and had that pre-existing substantial relationship with. Um, and it's been Wyoming people that are just interested in Wyoming companies. You know, and I, I always tell my clients, you can never underestimate the power of Wyoming people want to invest in Wyoming ideas and, and other Wyoming people. Because uh, I've seen it time and time again result in, in large amounts of capital being raised. So uh, Joe McGinley is one of the one of the most fun examples to talk about just because of the speed at which uh, we've been able to accomplish it. But again, that was a, as a going back to the uh, offering mechanisms I talked about. That has been a traditional 506B regulation B offering. Not all of those investors have been from Wyoming. However, the vast majority of those investors have been from Wyoming. So it's one of my examples I always go to when people say there's no, there's no private investment money in Wyoming, and I can tell you that there is. And uh, the guys in Silicon Valley might refer to it as dumb money, <laughs> because that, that's not meant to be a, a term, I don't think. 
dumb money just being people that aren't necessarily versed in, in offering structures and don't know exactly what terms. You know, if you get an offering from a, from a venture capitalist, you're going to get a term sheet with all kinds of terms, everything from, you know, the valuation of the company all the way to liquidation rights, you know, on the company going public. And so when, when we went to Wyoming investors, I think, again, nobody was taking advantage, but we were able to simplify the deal from an investment structure standpoint, say, look, we got one class of, of ownership here. Everybody's on the same page. Um, here's the company valuation. Here's how we arrive at the company valuation. Here's what the product is. Here's what the company is. Here's where we hope to take it. So it was really, it was really fun to kind of have that transparent conversation with so many investors across the state of Wyoming and truly just see them believe or invest in something that they believe in and something that they believe in that can impact in Wyoming. So that's that's one example. On, on the opposite end of the spectrum, I also represent a lot of uh, energy related clients and have helped them with a number of different uh, regulated offerings. And uh, again, it's 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 ranged everything from, from the Joe McGinley spectrum that I just talked about, all the way to, you know, one of my clients was successful in going to one uh, LP, Limited Partnership, publicly traded, and got complete funding for his project from one LP. And it was still, uh, as I said, I call it a regulated offering. It's technically you're trying to be an unregulated offering, but anyways, um, so, so that's that's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. This this whole crowdfunding mechanism, like I said, throws an interesting monkey wrench into into the offering landscape in Wyoming because, well, I, well, I said a moment ago, I think it has limited value for a lot of startups just because of the logistics of getting so many investors and having to manage so many investors. What I am finding with some of the more sophisticated companies and clients I have is they would like to explore the opportunity of doing layered offerings. So maybe we do a 506 offering on top of a crowdfunding offering. And so you can take advantage of potentially both at the same time. So you can simultaneously go out for the big investors and try to limit the number of investors you have and maximize your capital structure. But at the same time, you can go and do a crowdfunding offering to try to get that, that mass appeal and that mass media um, uh, PR benefit that, that so many companies want in conducting their offering. So anyways, I don't know how long I've been talking, I'll, I'll shut up for a while, but that's kind of uh, some of the, I guess, the different ends of the spectrum of, of offerings that I've seen successful in Wyoming. Uh, when we get to the question and answer, if anybody has any questions about specifics, um, I'd, I'd love to talk about some of the things that I think have made offerings more successful in Wyoming than others, um, and some maybe ideas looking forward, but thank you very much. Thanks, Matt. Um, and thank you to the, to Mike and the WIA for um, having me come speak. Um, I, uh, what I'm going to talk about, I guess this is kind of a box off sort of panel. I think I'm going to be the generalist here because um, I'm certainly not an energy specialist. And as I say, I'm an investor. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about a little bit is the early investment process. And from the vantage points, since I have investment chair of pension, an endowment, a foundation, and also a private investor in a family office, so I can get some views from that standpoint. Um, and also, I want to get some infrastructure, um, investment, um, I guess, thoughts as we've been looking at it through the various entities. Um, and then lastly, I just want to make a few comments in terms of funding um, with Wyoming's Economic Development Large Project Loan Program that we have in the state, which is very, very important. Um, so, I guess maybe likewise, I'll tell my Wyoming story quickly. Um, my family came out here in the 80s and bought a place, and so I spent a lot of time really being a very bad horseback rider, uh, taking our neighbor's cattle up to the mountains through the National Park, which back then you could do. Um, it sort of looked like a scene from City Slickers, to be honest with you. Um, and um, I truly just love being here in Jackson. And sort of post-college, I was all ready to continue my career working at the Alpine Slide up here um, when my parents said, maybe you ought to go somewhere else. Because unfortunately, at that point, Mo and the Chamber of Commerce hasn't really gotten all the nonstop flights here. And the ability of no internet and telecommuting couldn't do that. So anyway, so as Mike talked about, I'm a recovering hedge fund private equity guy that's lived around the world and 15 years ago came back here to raise a family. 
Um, and it's great now because you know we now have the ability to be able to do this. As I see one of my neighbors here who telecommutes to the West Coast. So I mean, it really is. It's amazing. Sort of these times of change. So let me start a little bit with sort of the early investment, um, kind of early stage investment process. I guess one of the one of the quotes I like to use was Steve Jobs when he when we talk about early investments. I'm actually proud of many things we haven't done just as much as the things that we have done, because you tend to look at a ton of deals, a ton of transactions, and I think that a lot of times we sometimes forget all the sort of transactions that we do pass that would have been probably a disaster. So one of the things I'll talk about is sort of what is a utopian sort of scenario or the perfect deal in terms of when we look at kind of early stage transactions. And you know, we sort of look for investing in market leading businesses that are operated by dynamic entrepreneurs. And these are big market opportunities. And of course, at reasonable future cash flow multiples. I mean, that's really what we're looking for. Please call me when you find one of these. Um, I would really, really would appreciate it. Um, and you know, in terms of our investment process, you know, we basically source through our networks. I mean, that tends to be really the best process. And I'll get a little bit more into almost, I think early stage deals is really, it is localized, almost like real estate to some degree. And so I'll get a little bit more into that. Um, you know, in terms of due diligence, you know, we really focus on domain knowledge and track, track records and history. Um, and then when it comes to terms, negotiating terms, you know, people always talk about how aggressive they are in trying to basically get blood out of a rock and grind terms. And frankly, I personally think it's a bad, bad scenario when you really want to see a line of interest. And, you know, as, as they sort of teach in business school, if you leave a negotiation with parties feeling a little bit put off, it's probably the best negotiation. Um, because you want to see alignment of the general partner and the limited partner. It's incredibly, incredibly important. And then the last point really on reporting, you don't really hear much people talk about reporting, but it's amazing to me how certain investors will get information and certain other investors won't, and that creates a real problem and it creates almost disingenuous. And so I encourage your companies out here with investors, make sure that everybody gets the same information. It's just incredibly, incredibly important. Um, you know, when we're also sort of looking at the early stage investments, you know, in terms of survival, and so we sort of talk about, you know, this thing's got to have like a must-have product, and product or technology, really, you know, and really understanding that cash is king. Um, you know, it's really also being trying to look at with your competitors, sort of best breed within your competitors, and then, you know, really, what is that pathway to profitability? And then when we look at sort of the operational review, you know, I mean, we try to look at sort of what is the next generation. Is the next generation really, does that mean a decrease in headcount? What does that mean? What does that mean in terms of the next version? Um, you know, what sort of features within quote, the product or the main thesis of the company is really absolutely essential? Um, you know, then when we start talking about GNA and marketing costs, you know, effectively, you know, how do we get a return on this expense? You know, and so it's really drilling down in terms of really being cash conscious. Um, and you know, the other thing we look at when we see the companies is sort of pipeline. It's very easy to put a pipeline on a piece of paper, and so the question is really what's the probability of actually closing all these things. Um, and so, um, you know, that basically bottom line is you really are trying to look and see about sort of when can a company become cash flow positive as soon as, soon as absolutely uh, possible. Um, Maybe shifting gears a little bit in terms of talking um, about from the more institutional side, say the retirement, the foundation, the endowment, you know, talking about infrastructure investing. You know, these are some of the points that we kind of learned over time, um, and particularly on early infrastructure. The thesis of build it, they will come doesn't work, frankly. Um, I mean, an example or say toll roads, where people will drive on the free roads a much longer period of time than people really realize. It's kind of a changing of habits, and so it's very challenging. Um, you know, we try to look at basically projects that have some sort of municipal backing, um, so you know there's some sort of backstop. And I think it's very analogous to development deals in real estate, where it needs to be done in phases. Um, and I think one of the other things, and this is more of a generally less issue, we tend to do more infrastructure deals in Europe than in, than in the US. And the reason is, is because of the public-private transaction. It's very challenging for US companies to own infrastructure. 
very challenging. And so because of that, you see very little money in the US going into transport, water, et cetera. And yet in Europe, policy tend to be a lot easier to do. Um, and so, um, you know, I guess when you really sort of focus in on the US in terms of where the money's been made on infrastructure, obviously to this room, it's been energy. Um, and also data centers and cell towers have been attracting a lot of capital. Um, you know, my last point, more Wyoming specific, is really talking a bit about the economic development large, uh, large project loan program. Um, having been on the retirement board for seven years, I've had the pleasure of working with Treasury as the uh, Treasurer Mark Gordon serves on our board. Um, and, you know, I think this is, for people that are not familiar with this program, this is a $75 million loan program within, housed within our Treasury funds. The Treasury funds are now in excess of $20 billion. Um, and basically, the Wyoming Business Council gets uh, applications for loans. They process it, it's then brought to the State Land Investment yeah. Board, which is a slip board, which is our public elected officials, uh, to decide. And then the Treasury really then digs down into sort of the credit qualities, et cetera. Um, and then eventually, the governor is the one that really gives the final okay. Um, these loans are incredibly um, attractive, um, given that they're given at uh, charged at 10-year bonds plus 50 basis points. So today, that's 2.85 percent. So, boy, as an emerging company, I sure would like to get one of those loans. Um, the state can't take equity in companies, and so that's against any state statute. Um, and you know, the other thing is, I think the state's now starting to work a little bit more with community banks, since obviously. They understand the business as being locally on the ground. Um, and so I, I know, I think, I should probably ask the new one over there, I think they're just they're talking about changing that in terms of some statutes. Um, but again, alignment with the banks clearly makes sense. And so I, I just, my comments here, I think this is an absolutely great program. And you know, again, dovetailing all my lives and Matt we're talking about. Um, but I do think from my investment experience, what I would, I think in terms of the, the, this, this, this program needs to be a little bit more thoughtful. We do the risk of these transactions, um, you know, the lack of ability for the state to take um, equity stakes to it um, is a challenge. Um, generally, in venture capital, there's a, a sort of negative, you know, with an 80 20 rule, where basically 80% of venture capital deals fail. And so, because of that, it's generally little bits of capital spread out amongst each bigger portfolio. And you know, I've seen with this program, 75 million, that it's, it's fairly concentrated. Um, and so, I would suggest that the state, why not only try to expand this program, but also have the ability to maybe change the state statutes so they can get equity. Because the problem is, if you did it through a loan, you know, the the, the risk associated with these deals, and then what the state would have to get compensated for, would not be viable in its capital structure. It just it just wouldn't work. Um, you know, other states are having trouble with this too. I know Colorado commits rates require a little bit on this. Uh, Louisiana has actually done a pretty good job in terms of bonding a lot of these projects, and so there's been some good public-private partnerships there. Um, and you know, I think one of the issues is really the Treasury staff spends an important amount of time working on these because it's very important to make sure that the state's money is spent wisely and it's their fiduciary responsibility. The problem is it's $75 million out of $20 billion. And so therefore, what I think needs to happen is, and one of the great things, I can't thank the legislature and the governor enough for both working with retirement and treasury to expand staff on these issues. I mean, remember, Wyoming has collectively $28 billion of, of assets. And so what we've been really, again, the state government's been very good at sort of helping us institutionalize this. But I think this particular program, and for particularly this sort of subject, that it'd be really important that we sort of expand and grow it and make sure that we have the bodies to be able to do the proper analysis. So I'll, uh, I'll conclude there. Wasn't that awesome? Great. Uh I think we have a few minutes for questions. Um, I'd like to maybe leave, uh, leave the questions sort of a, um, for, the, for the panel. So take a look at what's happening in Wyoming around the, um, the innovation around the carbon space. We have, obviously, we have the X-Prize coming with 
with five competitors that um, will actually then went up down from from a, a host of around 80 or so that are in Wyoming competing for a $10 million prize. Um, we have some um, innovators that the School of Energy Resources has um, made some investments in as it relates to some carbon captures, really carbon capture technologies that really, uh, in order to get to the next step, um, could use a little money. Um, we have an effort in Campbell County to uh, locate a carbon engineering center, and um, there's uh, some bad school technologies happening there right now with um, some companies that are um, developing some carbon-based products. So lots of things happening in that space. And so I guess from the, from the perspective of the panel, we've got three uh, very um, sort of unique perspectives that all really are very complementary. What would be maybe the top two things, maybe each panel, panelists would take one or two things, and then at the end of that, we have six great ideas. Um, what, what are the one or two top things that Wyoming should be doing to prepare itself to be able to leverage, take advantage of, and hopefully create a um, lot of the future for Wyoming to be successful? And we'll start with that. This one's the end. I'll, I'll jump on that because uh, I'm actually going to jet out of here and go to my endowed meetings. Uh, so sort of, I guess, dovetailing off of what we've been working on at, at Endow, the subcommittee that I'm on for Endow, for some reason, has been named the Public Policy uh, Subcommittee. But it's a little bit of a misnomer because the uh, thing that our committee is really looking at closely is this idea of the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Wyoming. And so our subcommittee, and I'll just go ahead and put it out there for, for criticism, our subcommittee has taken the approach a little different from some of the other committees in that we don't think that the recruitment of, of large companies necessarily needs to stop, but it hasn't proven to be real successful in Wyoming. So what our, what our committee is interested in is rather than recruiting that one you know, 500 employee uh, resulting company, why don't we look at how to start 100 five-person startups in you know the next five years? Because that's a hell of a lot of jobs, and that's a hell of a lot of diversification, and that's something that to us seems really doable. So what we've been specifically putting a plan together on is how can we you know what, what is the gap really in in Wyoming for those startups? And uh, we 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 do have Silicon Gular, which is. You know, I'll give a plug for them. Uh, all the way over in Cheyenne, we are envious of what they've got going, and uh, that organization is great. But it's it's kind of a lone wolf at this point. There's there's really not any other options like that around Wyoming. So we need to build up the success that they've had, and figure out how to create models like that in other places to just lower the barrier of entry for, for capital in Wyoming. Uh, you know, and, and Tom was Tom was talking a little bit about that and kind of what he's looking for in early stage companies. I completely agree from, from an investor standpoint. From just an economic diversification standpoint, though, in, in Wyoming's sake, the, the term I keep using at the endowment meeting is I just want to see churn. I want to see more companies starting, more companies failing, more companies being born out of that, and, and get more companies kind of in this life cycle. We have a lot of people in Wyoming with really cool ideas. We have music just cute. We have a lot of, uh, of really neat uh, entrepreneurs, a lot of people with, with you know, high, high skill levels within different industry segments. And we even have the presence of some really major industry players and companies, but, but connecting startups all the way to those major industry players seems to be a big gap in Wyoming. And so one of the ways that we are devising and maybe can help speed that up is to just create some more funding opportunities very early for those companies to get started and to progress along. So, anyway. Thanks. Yeah. Um, well, we have been talking, I think it's so more, we feel like we have a pretty good entrepreneurial ecosystem in a box, if you will, and we've tried to put together um, a pitch deck that would allow other communities in Wyoming to sort of take what we've done and see um, and introduce components of it to see how it will work in their ecosystem. Sorry. Yeah. Reminds me of a song. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have, I have a loud voice, so I'm. Is there, can everyone hear me? 
Yes. So, yeah, so we're talking with Indow and their preliminary stage. I'm not, I'm not involved with There's another board member who's leading it up, but we're talking with Indow about trying to export what we've done here to other parts of the community. And maybe that's even doing a first Monday everywhere in the, you know, five or six different communities in the state where we can take the content that we found that gathering entrepreneurs in a room or gathering people in a room to have beers is not hard, right? But figuring out the content that's going to nurture the discussions, the, the networking, all of that, that is hard. So we've talked about finding other um, communities, we've been talking to Matt about this uh, in Cheyenne, about feeding our content in to another group of people meeting at a bar that are, that are interested in entrepreneurship until they have the potential to sort of nurture their own content. And then that way there'd be first Mondays, other places in the state that could see, you know, and it may only be at the start four people in the room. It might not be like here where it was 100 people in the room, but it's got to start somewhere. And if we're talking about a five year lead, you know, um, there are a lot of smart people that and a lot of young people who are looking to do something other than traditional economy things in Wyoming and getting them in the room, getting them talking, and showing them that that is valued in their community is a really great place to start. So I'm more than happy to talk to anybody about that for their community and how we would think about that. Um, from Summit, we have graduated 100, and I didn't really talk about our startup intensive program, which is a 10 week intensive entrepreneurial boot camp that we in combination with Central Island College, who so have a campus here in Jackson. We have graduated 103 people from this program. It's a 200 hour, it's three full days a week for three weeks, or for 10 weeks. And we talk about oh, nine to three for three days a week. So we graduated 103 people. The majority of our people have come from Jackson, but two or three people from every class come from outside of um, actually outside of the state. They're here skiing, they've heard about it, their mom, dad lives here, they've heard about it. You know, we've had a couple people from River Gym come take the program. We'd like to figure out how to get more people into that program, but from a state funding perspective, um, we've had, when we started the program, we found it was pretty easy to get workforce training grants for entrepreneurs. And then now we have a very, very hard time getting workforce training grants for entrepreneurs. And I think that's really interesting because we've seen a lot of job creation in the startups that have happened out coming out of the startup intensive. And arguably, I would say there's more job creation in doing that than spending workforce training dollars on, you know, an existing business that's not going to hire anybody. So maybe trying to figure out how do we, how is that workforce training dollar more effective in growing and encouraging under the entrepreneurial ecosystem? throughout the state. Um, that would be something that's important. I think also you have to nurture what you value. And if we're really talking about building an entrepreneurial ecosystem here and building, you know, growth capital companies, then we really need to think about some, you know, our pitch day prize is $5,000. I mean, it's ridiculous, especially given where the richest town in the country, you know. $5,000 is nothing. Most other states, most other communities, I think in the UW one is $50,000. The one in, um, there's a new pitch day in um, on the Bighorn region. I think their product is something like maybe $20,000. Those are paltry. You know, they're tiny. You can't grow a company. You can't even hire a person. You can't even build a website for that sort of prize. So if you're really valuing it, then why aren't we doing $500,000 prizes across the state? Or five million dollar prizes across the state that spread out from the three winners so you can companies know that this is a place that values entrepreneurship that funds entrepreneurship that puts their dollars behind entrepreneurship i mean a million dollars in prize money would say a lot to the entrepreneurial community here but it's a tiny drop in the bucket in terms of that whatever 20 billion that tom was talking about um and these Wyoming Business Council funds, you know, I've had, there's only one or two startups I know that have managed to get those funds because there has to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, but there has to be a real estate component to those funds. And I think that, especially here in Teton County, where land is such a, um, 
such an issue, and we're trying to think about companies that complement the natural resources here and complement our values. Real estate isn't really what we want to talk about. We want to talk about companies that have you know, four or five really smart people in one room with phones and internet that can grow, uh, you know, a, a, a billion dollar company, not one that has to have a humongous footprint on our environment. Um, so I think changing sort of the, the funding mechanism of those finally business capital funds, I understand real estate in other parts of the state is good, but it might not be the right mix for encouraging entrepreneurship going forward in our new economy. I hope that helps. Okay.